Last week we uh, shared about fears and we talked about uh, the fear of uh, unanswered prayer, Zechariah and Elizabeth. We talked about the fear of the unknown with Joseph, the fear of the impossible with Mary, and then the fear of the telephone call at night, the unexpected news with the shepherds. And then I've concluded by saying we all need to develop a healthy sense of the fear of the Lord. And I think that's the glue that holds our society together. But that reverence and that awe and that wonder of who God is and how great God is. And Janet, you know, that's what you were saying this morning. God is so great. He's so awesome, so wonderful. And we want to bow down before him. But uh, we have uh, come now uh, one week into the new year. And uh, time was passing. Pretty soon it will be spring. Amen. And then summer and then fall and then winter again. All right. But uh, how many of you read Calvin and Hobbes or you read the comic strip uh, along the line? Uh, he says in one of the comic strips, it's, it's the New Year's. They're talking about the New Year's. And he says, Calvin says, I'm getting disillusioned with these New Year's. They don't seem to be very new at all. Each new year is just like the old year. Here another year has gone by and everything's still the same. There's still pollution and war and stupidity and greed. Things haven't changed. I say, what kind of future is this? I thought things were supposed to improve. I thought the future was supposed to be better. And of course, Hobbes replies with his usual insight, the problem with the future is that it always becomes the present. The problem with the future is that it always becomes the present. And so as we stop and we think about this, I, I go back and I, I just, you know, I, I, the, the more I read the word, it's just like reading the morning newspaper. I mean, we're living in a time in which uh, is very uh, distressing uh, to me, and I'm sure to you. I cannot but help think of what it's going to be like for our kids and our grandkids. I mean, all sorts of things are happening. The foundations of our country are being dismantled. The Christian faith is being dismantled. The Christian faith is under assault. The Christianity is diminishing. We find, of course, that church attendance has declined tr dramatically uh, since the pandemic. All these things are happening. On top of all of this, we have, uh, you know, uh, the, the topsy-turvy things of the Christian mores who are being uh, destroyed. And it's just really, you know, people have, have actually believed a lie. And the Bible says in Romans 1 that they've suppressed the truth in unrighteousness. And I think that's what's happening in our world today. We're actually suppressing the truth. But uh, as we come this morning, we're going to be talking about Isaiah 40. And I, I like Isaiah 40 because uh, it's one of those uh, scripture passages that just speak to my heart. And it actually begins and handles Messiah. But uh, he begins by, by talking about how he wants to comfort the people. He says, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. And it's a very distressing, distraught time in the life of the people of Israel. Uh, things are not going well for them at all. We find that uh, Isaiah is addressing a people who have been in exile. They are a people who have witnessed the city of Jerusalem destroyed, the temple destroyed. They have uh, witnessed the uh, you know, creation of all sorts of uh, crazy things in their life. And they're really, really depressed and really, really distraught. All these trials, they're discouraged in their own heart and their own life. And as I stop and I think about this, I, I think about, of course, one of the stories that my dad shared with me many years ago, and I've shared it here in this, in this room, about some uh, grandparents who went, went to visit their, their son or their daughter, or whatever it would be, and the grandpa went to sleep on the couch. And the grandkids thought they would play a joke on him, and so they very, very carefully and very, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, anyway, very carefully took a piece of Limburger cheese and rubbed it on his mustache beneath his nose. And when he got up, he said, you know, this room sort of smells. I mean, man, what is this? And he, he decided to go out to the kitchen. And so he went out to the kitchen. He says, well, the kitchen, the kitchen stinks too. And so he decided, I'm, I, need a, I need some fresh air. And so he went outdoors and he took a deep breath of fresh air. He says, the whole world stinks. <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes that's my conclusion when I read the morning paper. The world just plain stinks. I mean, everything is going down the tube. But, you know, we have hope in Jesus Christ. We have hope in the, in the Lord. And as we, we turn to the book of Isaiah, very simply, what we find here is these words. He says, comfort my people, says our God. Comfort them. Encourage the people of Jerusalem. Tell them that they have suffered long enough and their sins are now forgiven. I have punished them full for all their sins. A voice cries out, prepare in the wilderness a road for the Lord. Clear the way in the desert for our God. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and the people will see it. And the Lord himself has promised this. 
Uh, I should have made my print a little bit bigger back there, but you know, that's the way it goes in life. But here we have again the people of God, and they're, they're this difficult time. And again, the city's been destroyed, Jerusalem's been destroyed, the temple's been destroyed, all these things are happening, and they're just down in the dumps. And what we find happening is this. He brings them good news. He says, your punishment is done. You're going to be come forth into deliverance. You know, the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed. The Lord has promised this. Things are going to change. And rather than listen to the good news, they stuff their ears full of cotton. They blind their eyes and they turn to idolatry. And they turn and they say things like, God is not just. God isn't fair. God, we're your people. How could you allow this to happen? And it says very simply this. God has lost track of me. He doesn't care what happens to me. He's lost track of me. He doesn't care what happens to me. Another translation says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and why do you speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. In other words, they completely feel forsaken by God. They can feel completely forsaken by God. And the thing about this is they become so discouraged and their discouragement that it became their normal way of life. You know, we've heard the words over and over and over again the last several years. The new normal, the new normal, the new normal. It became the new normal for them to live in discouragement and depression. And have you ever been there? Have you ever known somebody to be like, well, I guess this is the way it's always going to be. I guess I'll just live with it. And rather than look for hope, rather than look for something to change, they live in this despair and live in this discouragement. Now, you know, they felt like God had forgotten about them. And there are times in my life, and I'm sure there's times in your life, when you feel like God has forgotten about you. You've prayed, maybe like Zachariah and Elizabeth prayed, and you feel like God has forgotten about you, that he doesn't answer your prayers. Not only do we feel forgotten by God, but we forget, feel forgotten by other people. You know, there are parents in this room who are saying, why don't my child, why don't my kids ever write? Why don't they call? Why don't they ever send a text or an email or a message of some sort? There are, there, are, there are grandkids. I have a, a grandson who, you know, it was his birthday. And, and we found out about this through his mother. And his mother says, you know, so-and-so is really bummed about this. You didn't send him any gifts this year. We usually send like a, you know, a, a certain amount of money. We, he didn't receive any money this year. And we said, well, we're certain we sent him some money. No, he said you didn't send him any money. He's really bummed about that. He felt like we had forgotten about him. There are people who sit around the Christmas tree and everybody gets a present but them. And I think about my mother who's in a nursing home and you've had many individuals in, of your family in nursing homes and I've visited tons of people in nursing homes. And you know, in nursing homes, time stands still. You know, one day seems like, you know, an eternity. And for us, we come and we go and we're involved in all these sorts of things and they sit there in the room and say, doesn't anybody care for me? Why doesn't my son, why doesn't my daughter come and visit? And they feel forgotten. They feel lonely. They feel left out. We've all been there. God has forgotten about us. We have forgotten about us. But the good news of the gospel is, and what Jesus Christ wants to declare throughout Scripture, and what Isaiah declares is that God never, ever forgets. We may forget, but God never forgets. I think of two uh, quotes that come from, one is from Larry Crabb. And he says very simply, I have come to a place in my life where I need to know God better or I won't make it. Life at times has a way of throwing me into such a blinding confusion and severe pain that I lose all hope. Joy is gone and nothing encourages me. J.B. Phillips says this, To some people, the mental image of God is a kind of blur of disappointments. Here is the one whom I have trusted, but he let me down. You ever felt like God let you down? The great saints of the past went through what was called the dark night of the soul. And they went through this wilderness experience. It was all darkness. I mean, seemingly God was distant. God was not present. Their prayers were not being answered. It was a very difficult wilderness experience in their life. And then I think, of course, of Jesus Christ himself on that cross. When he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, why have you forgotten me? And the question is, how do we navigate these painful times? 
How do we navigate those mountainous terrains of loneliness when it feels like God has forgotten about us? And not only has God forgotten about us, but we have forgotten about us. We've forgotten each other. I mean, there are people, I can guarantee you, who are a part of this congregation who are saying, nobody cares for me, nobody ever calls me, nobody ever says they miss me. We feel forgotten. What's the answer and what's the clue? I like this. He says very simply, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. I think about, of course, you know, uh, when I was, you know, here, uh, Beth, of course, being the secretary, and she had the combination to the safe. I didn't. I didn't know how to work it. She did, and she could get into it. But let's change the scenario here. Let's say this. A Sunday school teacher went into the, to the room where the safe was located because she needed some important documents. And she went into that, that room and she turned the numbers this way and she turned it back this way and the safe would not open. And so she went over to the pastor and says, Pastor, said, I'm having a hard time getting into the safe. Could you help me? And he says, sure. So he went over to the room where the safe was at and he turned the knob this way and he turned the knob that way. And then he paused and, 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 and he couldn't, he just couldn't remember that third number. And so he looked up to heaven and she saw his lips mutter. And then he looked back down at the dial and he turned the dial back this way and lo and behold, the safe opened. And she says, boy, pastor, you've got quite a lot of faith. He says, no, it wasn't faith at all. The combination's written on the ceiling. <laughs> Sometimes we need to look up to the ceiling. You know, if you go into a nursing home, I've been in there and you have to poke these little numbers to get out. You know, if you look close enough, sometimes they have the code written above the, the door. I mean, lift up your eyes into the heavens. Lift up your eyes into the heavens. And I think about Isaiah. Here he is. Chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Wow, read those chapters. It will be just like watching the news. I mean, the world was in disarray. It says they were calling good evil and evil good. Does that sound like today? Sure it does. And on top of that, Uzziah, the king, had died. And Isaiah is distraught. I mean, the whole society and culture is in disarray. Uzziah the king, the stability of the time, has died. But notice what he says in chapter 6. And the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Where? Sitting upon a throne. And the seraphim were all around crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And it changed his entire life. I think about Luke chapter 21. Jesus is talking with his disciples. And he's talking about the end times, the end of days. And he's saying in the end of days there will be wars and rumors of war. There will be plagues and pandemics and all sorts of pestilences. There will be all sorts of lies and deceit and corruption around you. And people will come after you and they will persecute you just like they're persecuting me. But he says, behold, the Son of Man is coming on the clouds. And then he says, lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these things? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each one by name because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Friends, if we look up, we can cope. If we look up to the throne of God, we have hope. Notice what it says. He calls each star by name. And if he knows every star by name, that means he knows your name and he knows my name. He knows your name and he knows my name. And nothing is too big or too small that what we cannot bring before God. And God is concerned about those. He puts them all in the, in the starry skies. He holds the planets in the palm of his hand. He has them all by name. And then notice a little bit later in chapter 40. He says, do you not know and have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. That's a truth that I need to remember. I find that my, my rememberer is getting, you know, worse as I get older. I can read a book and, and uh, read a page of a book and I'll say, oh, I remember that. Can't remember it a minute after I read it. I had a really neat dream the other day and I was going to tell Lena about that. Forget that. <laughs> Can't remember it all. But, you know, I think about, I think about my mother. Uh, you know, we need to remember and we need to rehearse, but every one of you had parents who have wrestled with uh, memory problems, dementia or Alzheimer's. You, you understand what I'm talking about. And, I, you know, I, I think of the, the day that 
my sister had a meeting with the administrator and the director of nursing and the social worker, and mom was also in that room. And I went there a couple of days after that, and she was saying to me, who's my mom? Are they my mom? Is, is she my mom? And she calls my sister her mom. And I said, no, and I tried to explain it to her. Well, who's my, who's my mom? And she was so confused, she didn't know. The other day I was there and she says, now, how many sons do I have? Do I have, I have three sons, right? And I said, no, you have two sons and one daughter. No, you, no, I have got three sons. Now, I think she was thinking of her brothers because she had three brothers and she was a daughter. But you know, we, 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 we forget and we forget so easily. Sometimes it's because we have a, a, a dementia or whatever it might be and sometimes it's just because we don't exercise it but we need to remember and we need to rehearse these sorts of things in our life but notice what it says the Lord is the everlasting God and when you look at the Lord and God in that verse it's the name the personal name for God that he revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai when Moses says who should I say sent me and God says tell them that I am that I am has sent you unto them. And so it's Jehovah or Yahweh. It's the personal. He's not just a distant God somewhere. He's not a God of abstract, just, just abstract knowledge. He's a God who's personally involved. He's a God who became flesh and dwelt among us. And not only that, but he's the everlasting God. He's the forever God. He is a God who does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is a God who is interested in us. He's not a deistic God like we find, you know, some of our founders in the early 1700s, that he created this world and created you and me, and he walked off. God knows about me. He has every star named. He knows your name and your identity, your being. He's got the very hairs of your head numbered. Isn't that great? He knows every sparrow that falls, every lily that pops up from the ground. He knows every tear that drops down your cheek and every cry from your heart. He knows it all and he cares. Had for God forgotten these people? No. No, not in any way. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. They had grown faint. They had grown weary. But it says here he gives power to the faint. And to them who has no might, he increases strength. Now notice further here. Because it says later on in Isaiah, For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on the afflicted ones. But Zion says, The Lord has forsaken me. He's forgotten me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, what does it say? I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you upon the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. You've inscribed me on the palm of your hands. How many of you have ever written, remember in school you wrote, how many of you ever wrote your assignments on the palm of your hands? Here's a question I will ask, I shouldn't ask, how many of you wrote the answers to the test questions on the palm of your hands? <laughs> I mean, why didn't you write them on your shoulder or your neck, you know? He's inscribed you on the palm of his hands. Inscribed you. He doesn't forget. The palms are always visible. He has them written. He can always see them. Again, it's not on your neck. It's not on the back shoulder. It's right there on the palm of your hands. It's always visible. You're always in his line of sight. And the word here means more than that. It means to be engraved to be engraved. That means there's a hammer and chisel involved. And a hammer and chisel means there's some pain involved as well. But it's permanent. You take a hammer and a chisel, you know, you take, you, you, on the palm of your hands, what would happen? You write your test questions on the palm of your hand, you go in the bathroom, you say, oh my, I washed them off. No, when, you, when they're engraved, they're not coming off. They're not coming off. I think of my grand, two of my grandkids when they were younger, uh, uh, their parents took them to church and left them in the church office and they had some other things to do in the church. And when they came back to the room, and I wish I would have had a picture of this, but uh, you know, they get lost in your digital vault when you're safe and you can't find any pictures at all. But anyway, when they came back to the office, they had gotten into their desk drawer and had gotten out the black felt markers and they had drawn glasses, mustaches, beards, 
anything that you can imagine on their face. Now you know it was, it was humorous, but also what in the world did you do? <laughs> can you imagine that? I mean, they took alcohol, they took everything to try to wash that off their face, and they finally got it off. They were a sight to behold, I tell you. But anyway, if it's engraved, it's not coming off. It is permanent. It's forever. And he says, I've engraved you on the palm of my hands. You're ever before me. Now let's move into the future here some four or five hundred years because we come to the time of Christ. Jesus has been crucified. And the disciples are doing what? They've seen him crucified and they've buried him. And now they're hiding for fear of the Jews behind closed doors. They're afraid what happened to their master is going to happen to them. And they're hiding behind these closed doors when Jesus appears among them. And they're just blown away. Later they tell Thomas, he wasn't there at the first time. He says, Thomas, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. He's been raised. He's alive. Now I'm not going to believe it unless I see the, the nail prints and the wounds, put my finger to this side. I'm not going to believe it. And then some days later, Thomas is there and Jesus appears before him and shows him his hands. And he sees his name engraved there. He sees the penalty that he paid for him. And he cries out, my Lord and my God. Jesus Christ engraved us on the palm of his hands. And they're forever there. Forever there. Now, you know, when we stop and we think about this, of course, I want you to just stop for a moment and think about you know, your, your life and your situations, because I don't know all the situations. I don't know all your fears. I don't know all your concerns in your life that you, that you have. But you know, whatever might be the season of suffering or the season of pain that you're in right now, I want to just declare to you what Isaiah declared to these people. God has not forgotten of you. God has not forsaken you. He's still present with you. I mean, we may forget God, I mean, how often do I forget the promises of God? How often do I forget, you know, my inheritance that God has preserved for me in heaven? You know, we forget his blessings. We forget how he prays for us daily at his throne. How he agonizes. We forget how he has blessed us in the heavenly places. How he's forgiven us of our sins. But I want to tell you that God doesn't forget us. He weeps over us. He encourages us. He comforts us. He walks with us. Again, he, he, he's, he's there for us in everything that we endure and go through. I mean, friends, listen to me. Jesus Christ was forsaken and he was forgotten so that you and I would never be forsaken. He was forsaken on the cross of Calvary so that we would never be forgotten. And we go through this life and maybe you're not, you know, we're in this spiritual battle, we're in this situation and we're going through this tough time and, and, and this voice of condemnation speaks to our heart and said, oh, look what you've done, you've blown it. You can't be forgiven. But the Lord shows me the scars in my name on the palm of his hand and says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He sees my discouragement and how I've sunken into hope and in many ways have blinded my eyes to the promises and he comes alongside of me and encourages me. He sees me in the midst of the boat, in the midst of the storm, and the waves are washing over the side and the winds are blowing on the sails, threatening to sink me, but he's there in the boat with me and reminds me, I command the storm, I can control the storm, I know all the stars and I can say, peace be still. Or he sees me crawling through the wilderness, seeking for some fresh water thirsting for something that will satisfy my soul. And he reminds me that he is the living water. And he's there with me. He's there for me. You see, not only are those nail-scarred hands where he has me inscribed and engraved on the palm of his hands, but the Bible says what? Neither shall any man snatch them out of my hands. And I like that. Because it says no matter how hard the adversary comes against you, no matter how hard the enemy fights against you, that no one is going to take you from my hands because not only have I bought you with a price and engraved you on my palms, but I hold you securely in my arms and my hands and nobody will take you from me. You're forever secure. And I like what Paul says, of course, in the book of Romans. And I want us to read this together. If you will, read it with me. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Nothing will separate us. Just put in there, nothing will separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Again, we all go through these times in our life when we feel like the people of Israel. And we begin to accept discouragement and depression and, and despair as the new normal. Friends, it's not the new normal. Jesus Christ has prepared for us blessings and hope and peace. He's given it all to us in the blood of Jesus Christ. And whenever you, whenever you seemingly feel forgotten, look at his palms because you're ever before him. Look at your palms and let them be a life lesson that even as you wrote that formula, you know, even as you wrote that, that, that grocery list or whatever it might be on the palm of your hands, be assured that Jesus Christ has written you on the palm of his hands. And your name is never coming off. It's permanent. It'll never wear off. It will never wash off. Friends, he has not forgotten you. He's not forgotten us. He's not forgotten the church because the church will prevail and declare the victory of Jesus Christ. Precious Lord, we come to you today and life is hard, life is cruel, life is tough. And there are times that we do step back and we have stepped back and we say, God, you're not fair. God, you're not just. And we complain and we murmur and we look to ourselves and our situation. I pray today, Lord God, that you would teach us to look up, to lift up our eyes into the heavens and to see all the wonders that you have created. The Lord, when we look around us and see the lily, the flower, the rose, the sparrow, the mountains, the hills, the valleys, the streams, the stars in the sky that you call each one by name. Let them be a life lesson to us that you have written our names on the palm of your hands and you hold us secure. You're Emmanuel, God with us. Oh Lord, I pray. May each and every one of us leave this place today feeling the sweet embrace of our living Lord around us. Oh Lord, hold us tight. Hold us close. Be our God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As I was singing those words, I, I think the last time I sang that was at Doris's funeral. And it was one of the songs that she wanted to be, have sung because she lived her life and she died knowing that she had a God who was great and mighty and who had given her the hope of everlasting life. Again, when you look up, you can cope. When you look up, you have hope. So in Jesus Christ we trust. Well, may you go forth with God's blessings and peace upon your heart. Go in peace. Amen.